gas training, how a combi boiler works. My name's Alan Hart and today I've got a very special guest today. I'm over at Viva Training Academy and I've got an ex-Baxi trainer, Roy. He's been a trainer for over 20 years. I've been on many of his training courses. In my opinion, he's one of the best trainers in the industry. And we've got Roy today and Roy's gonna go through a combi boiler. He's gonna look at all the different components in a combi boiler. And he's gonna go, go through them, explain how they work. So for, if you're a new recruit into the industry or just somebody who just wants to know more about boilers, then this video is definitely for you. So without further ado, let's go over to Roy. This video is for gas safe registered and trainee gas engineers under supervision. Please comply with the current regulations at the time. Hi guys, it's Roy Fiumbo here again at the uh, Viva Training Academy over in Halifax. And today we're going to have a look inside a combi boiler. This particular boiler is a Potterton Assure, which is exactly the same internally as a Baxi 600, Baxi 800 and Main Eco Compact. We're going to look at the various components in there. And a little bit basic, we're going to go through what those components do, why they're in there. And also we're going to be stripping some of those components out, showing how easy it is to work on them should you need to get them out. So without further ado, let's start off. And we've got an expansion vessel. The reason behind an expansion vessel, when you heat water up, that water expands. It expands 4% its volume, so we need to take up the expansion of the water as we're heating it up. In there we've got a pump. The idea behind the pump, very much like in your body, you've got a pump pushing blood around your body to keep you going. The pump in there is pushing water around the radiator circuit in heating mode or around the plate heat exchanger in hot water mode. So coming down to the plate heat exchanger, plate heat exchanger in there to transfer the heat from your primary water, the water that's going around the main heat exchanger, it goes through the plate and then your cold water comes in and goes through the other side of that plate and transfers the heat so you get nice hot water coming out of your taps. Obviously we need to get some fuel in there so we've got a gas valve, it's what's called a zero governor. We'll explain a little bit more about that when we come to it and we start taking it out. We've got a fan in there, the fan, a little bit like our lungs. Our lungs allow us to bring air in because we need the oxygen for us to breathe and us to live. The boiler needs oxygen for combustion so that's what the fan's doing. The air's coming down on this air intake tube, it's actually a silencer tube. Modern boilers now, they're all trying to outdo each other different manufacturers and this is Bax's idea about making the boiler a little bit quieter so it's fetching air in down there and it's mixing in with the fan, with the gas, so the air gas mixture goes into the fan, up through a mixing tube onto the burner and that's going to heat the main heat exchanger. So you've got the main heat exchanger in there, that's the main part, that in there is what's converting the heat from the gas into the water which is circulating around your system. We've got a diverter motor there which is attached onto a diverter valve. That diverter motor when we turn the tap on it'll lift the pin up so the water goes through the plate heat exchanger and then when we've turned the tap off it stays in that position. We get a demand for heat and we put our radiators on. The motor actions down, pushes a pin down and allows the water to go around the heating circuit. This is a modern condensing boiler, so it's got a condensate trap in there. The heat exchanger is producing some condensate, that goes into that trap, and then it goes out through the condensate path. We've also got a low pressure cutoff switch in there. The idea behind that is if the pressure in the boiler drops too low, it won't fire up, it won't what we call dry fire, because we don't want it to fire up if there's no water in there. We've also got an overheat thermostat. The idea behind that, if the boiler gets a little bit too hot, that kicks in and it's a safety device. We've also got two thermistors, one on the return and one tucked away on the floor, which we'll see a little bit later on. We'll zoom in so you can see those. Those are both temperature sensors. So they're measuring the temperature of the water going out to the radiators or into the plate heat exchanger and then back from the radiators or back from the plate heat exchanger. We've also got another thermistor down there that one sits in a wet pocket. 
the flow and return are both in what's called dry pockets so you don't need to drain down to replace them the one on the hot water side is in a wet pocket that's monitoring the hot water temperature going out to taps we don't want the water to be too hot to scald people so that's the idea behind that we've also got what's called a prv pressure reducer uh, pressure relief valve that's in there because if we get too much pressure if the expansion vessel can't take it up or we get a fault that will start to drip and eventually if the pressure builds up and up and gets to about three bar that will fully discharge and that pipe is normally going outside safe and uh, visible so what we'll do now we'll start taking some of these components out right so now we've looked at the various components we're going to start taking the components out before we take any components out of any boilers make sure you have a set of manufacturer's instructions so you fully understand what you're doing obviously PPE the correct tools that you need so the first thing I'm going to remove is the expansion vessel for clarity so you guys can see what I'm doing we've removed the wiring harness out of this boiler we've also took the side panels off on this particular boiler the side panels come off having said that back say do say that all the parts can come out from the front and from experience I know they can I must have stripped one of these boilers down countless times in my past life as a backsy trainer so there's two ways of taking the expansion vessel out if the side panel can come off it's easier to take it off and go out the side if it can't it can come out the front and we've got to remove the air guide guide and the bracket so we're going to remove it from the side so the first thing we're going to do the little tube which feeds it and connects onto the manifold on that there is a little clip so we pull the clip out it's just a little stainless steel clip and then we ease that that tube down and we can leave that out of the way on the top of the expansion vessel there is a locking nut so we would slacken the locking nut off i tend to use a pair of wide mouth adjustable spanners and all i need to do is just slacken that off so that it becomes finger tight i can then get my fingers up there unscrew it remove the locking nut and then easing the expansion vessel down freeze the hole comes out the side and then we've got the expansion vessel now on the expansion vessel there's a label that label explains quite a lot of information on there it says it's seven liters so it's capable of taking seven liters of expansion it's got seven liters of expansion in there there's also a couple of uh, little uh, diagrams one's explained the type of expansion vessel it is this expansion vessel has a diaphragm inside it the idea of the diaphragm on one side of it you've got water so the water's coming in there and the other side of it you've got air so there's a Schrader valve the other common type of expansion vessel you'll find in our industry is used on unvented cylinders that tends to have a bladder inside it the idea of the bladder is the air's in the bladder uh, sorry the air's outside the bladder the water's in the bladder so the water doesn't touch the metal because of corrosion and contamination in this case we're not too worried about that because in the heating system we put things in like inhibitors and chemicals so on there it's set at a pressure and this one's at 0.8 of a bar so it comes out the factory at 0.8 so that's where we should be setting it there's a misconception that if you've got a slight problem with your expansion vessel and it's dripping a little bit through the prv you put more pressure in it takes longer for it to start dripping that's totally wrong you need to set them up as per the manufacturers some are set at one bar some are set at point eight just again refer to the manufacturer's instructions or the little data badge on there it's working pressure is three bar because that ties in with the prv and it's maximum test pressure on this particular one is four and a half bar so it's tested up to four and a half bar so in the future we're going to do a video about how to repressurize an expansion vessel and things like that but i'll quickly cover it the main thing when you're repressurizing an expansion vessel is you want to get rid of the water pressure before you check the air pressure so you drain the boiler down you don't need to drain the whole of the system you're just taking the pressure out wherever you drain it from and on some boilers there are drain points there are drain cocks on the boilers that's the ideal place don't use the prv because if you do i'll guarantee it'll get dirt on it and it'll drip and you'll end up having to replace it 
So we drain the boiler down, we leave the drain point open. The reason being is if we need to put air in, we want to push that water out. We don't want to trap any water pressure, which will give us a false reading. Again, we're going to do a video about that later on. So that's the expansion vessel. So that's come out. So I'll just pop that down. And the next thing we're going to come to is the pump. Right, so we're going to remove the pump head. Um, common faults that we get with pumps, sticking, because normally older systems that haven't been flushed, you can get dirt in the system. Um, on this particular pump, there is a hole down the centre so you can check the impellers spinning, so you can check that it's moving. I'll show you now where the screwdriver goes, but once we get the head out, I'll show you how to do that. Now this particular boiler is a dry boiler, it's not had water in it, it's all been drained down. One of the features of this particular boiler is that there's a little channel. So a lot of times when you're draining boilers down, you've got all the water out of them, but you still have a little bit of residual water in things like your plate heat exchange and the pump. So this one's got a little channel in there and there's a little rubber bung that you can slap, you can just pull it down and then pop a little container underneath it, just so that if there's any residual water, it'll run down there and trickle into it. So what we need is a four mil Allen key. I tend to use these Allen key screwdrivers. And then we've got four bolts that we remove. So it doesn't really matter which way you take them out. Um, when I pop them back, I tend to pop them back like I'm tightening up a car tire or a car wheel, so opposite. So we're into there. Now this particular pump is a Grunfoss ERP pump, so it's got two connections. Again, once I've got it out, I'll explain a little bit more about those. So there's two screws there, as you can see, we can get in, it's a little bit tight, but there is room to get in there. So it's no big shakes removing a pump head, because typically most manufacturers now, they will sell you the pump heads, because it's a cheaper thing than changing a complete pump. Because a lot of the bodies now are thermoplastic, so you don't really need to change the whole body of the pump, you just need to replace the heads on there. So I've got the last bolt now coming out. So there we go, there is a little bit of water come out, as you can see. And it's popping out there, so I'm just draining him down. So we've got the pump out, so that's the impeller. That's the bit that's gonna spin. Now this is an ERP pump, energy related products. A few years ago, we went on to ERP. That's, you may remember, coloured labels coming out, A, B, C, D. It's all about energy efficiency. The idea of the pump, it's the biggest energy user inside the boiler. So all the manufacturers had to start putting energy related pumps in. That's why you've got two connections on there. The larger connection is your mains connection, your live neutral and earth, and the smaller connection is a lower voltage. Typically it's called a PWM connection, power wave modulation. In plain English, it's, con it's talking to the circuit board or communicating with the circuit board and dependent on how many radiators are open. So when the system comes on first thing in the morning, and you've got eight or nine radiators all wanting heat, the pump will run faster, it'll use more energy, it'll push the water out. As the thermostatic radiator valve starts to close down, and you go from maybe eight radiators to seven to six to five, the pump doesn't need to use as much energy, so it'll slow down, so that's what ERP is. You may come across some of the early ERP boilers, they'll only have the mains connection, they won't have that connection in there. That connection, if it's not in there, the pump runs at maximum all the time. Now, one of the features that you can do with an ERP pump with it, if you suspect you've got poor circulation, the pump's struggling, you could unplug that connection, it's low voltage, you can unclip it. That should get the pump to run on to maximum. The other thing you could do, as I mentioned, you can pop the screwdriver in there. So what you're doing, you're moving the impeller around. So if you went to a pump, possibly a house that's been empty, somebody's moved out, it's not been occupied for a few months, the pump can sometimes seize up. So we can pop the little screwdriver in and get that pump running without replacing the pump. So that's your ERP pump. The impel, as I mentioned, it's a bit small than a standard one because it's all about energy efficiency. It's not pushing water, it's spinning water. The easiest way to explain, if you've got a bottle, one of these little Diet Coke bottles or something like that, fill it full of water, tip it out, time it, Fill it up again, spin it round so you've got it circulating, then tip it out, it empties a lot quicker. That's the idea behind these, using less energy, more efficiency. So that's the pump, um, quite simple to remove, very, very easy to work on. 
it's a sealed unit so we're not going to take anything else from that so i'll just pop that down so the next thing we're going to look at is the air gas unit so we're now talking about the air gas unit so we've got the burner the mixing tube the fan and the air intake so the first thing i'm going to do is just disconnect the spark electrode lead this particular boiler has one electrode that does both spark electrode and rectification some you may find on boilers they've got two one's a spark electrode one's a rectification electrode so the first thing we need to do is remove the air tube so there's a little plastic lug that just pops out and then the air tube comes out the way so that's moved that out the way I'm then just going to remove a little clip which holds the gas pipe in the gas pipe's flexible so that will just pull out and pop down to one side I'm now going to use a 10 mil nut driver I could use a socket or a spanner and I'm going to remove these bolts so again very similar to removing the pump you've got four and uh, in this case the nuts not bolts that you're removing and again as I said with the pump very similar to when you're removing car wheels I always tend to do opposites it's just a force of habit you may notice uh, there is a little bit of paint on here when the boiler was put together in the factory the guy or girl who put the burner module in the air gas unit in they'll have marked it to tell the next operative that they would completely tighten things up so removing all those as you can see it's just hanging there on the top two so i'm just going to remove it now so this is the air gas unit so first part we've got is the fan so the fan is drawing air uh, drawing gas in drawing air in, mixing air and gas in there again very similar to your pump there are two electrical connections a mains connection and again a PWM connection power wave modulation dependent on the output that the boiler requires the amount of heat the fan speeds up and slows down that's the idea behind pre-mix burners it's only using the amount of air and gas that it needs it's not using too much so that's what the idea behind that fan is it's got a circuit board built onto the fan which again is communicating with the main circuit board and deciding at what speed it needs to do so they're communicating all the time if you come back up to the burner as we can see we've got the electrode there so it's got a little dog leg on and then we've got the spark gap that's the uh, combustion seal now that seal is made out of flexible elastomeric silicon rubber yes Ian Scott if you're listening I can say elastomeric silicon rubber now I didn't used to be able to what that means is this seal can be reused it doesn't need to be changed every time it's a case of if you demount the air gas unit check that seal make sure it's still flexible there's a little tip and I'm just going to pop it back in it sits into a groove as we move that in an easy way to test to make sure that it's still supple enough is just make sure that you've got it into the groove and then turn it over tap it on the back if it doesn't drop out it's still supple it doesn't need to be replaced some manufacturers they will say you need to replace their seal every time you remove it so again check with the particular boiler manufacturer's instructions but back set it's on an as and when basis so the next thing we're going to look at once we've popped this down we're going to go to the gas valve right so here's the gas valve to remove that there are two three millimeter bolts underneath and obviously the gas connection in the real world we'd be isolating the gas making sure that that's that's shut off so i'm just going to remove the two three mil bolts using my uh, my allen key so i'm just up underneath and only short little allen keys allen bolts so i'll pop the first one out into the second one and then we'll pop it out so this particular gas valve is an SIT848 gas valve. It's been used by lots and lots of manufacturers. Baxi have been using SIT848 gas valves for a long, long time. The subtle difference with this particular one compared to previous models like the Eco Blue and the Duotech or the Platinum, which you may be familiar with, this one is low voltage. This one we're talking about around about 12 volts those were 240 volts again it's all about energy efficiency ERPs 
using less electricity to power our boilers, making them more efficient. So, because it's what's termed a zero governor, what we mean by that is, if we tested a pressure on the outlet of the gas valve, we may get zero, we may get a negative reading. It's all down to the way that it's sucking air and gas through. The older, what we would term normal aspirated boilers, like the old Baxi 105, the Baxi Solo, things like that, you could do a burner pressure. We don't do burner pressures on modern condensing boilers because of the zero governor. We do an inlet working pressure, so we have the boiler running and we check the inlet pressure to make sure it's within specification. Couple of things on that. Baxi say that we can adjust the CO2s, and again, later on, in the future we're going to do a video of how to set those up and how to how to check them but just quickly under this little screw which is a formula allen key so again i've got my formula allen key i can remove that screw and all i'm doing is unscrewing the little cap take the cap out and under there there's a grub screw and that allows me to adjust my minimum my minimum co2s so I'd have a flue gas analyzer in, check the specification, and I can make sure that that's set up correctly. Once I've proved that I do need to adjust it after checking things like um, my air intake and stuff like that. The other adjustment I've got is underneath the little blue cover. It's a two and a half mil Allen screw. So again, two and a half mil Allen screw. And what I've got in there is a little grub screw and I'm closing that down or opening it up and that's affecting my maximum CO2s. So again, in the manufacturing instructions, it explains the maximum minimum and you force it to max, force it to min, and that's the adjustments that you can do on that gas valve. So again, quite a common gas valve out there. I know Worcester use a similar gas valve, um, but I'd have to double check their instructions to see if it allowed me to adjust it. I wouldn't adjust it without checking their instructions. So that's the gas valve. So following on from that, we're going to come to the diverter valve. Right, so we're going to pop the diverter motor off. So there's a little clip which comes out, then the motor pops off. So I'm going to remove the diverter cartridge. It's got a replaceable cartridge. And um, again, I use my trusted wide mouth adjustable spanner and I put it across the castellations and just ease it to slacken it off. Once it's slack, it can be removed. And the idea behind the cartridge is this can be replaced. Again, if the system hasn't been properly flushed out, if it's got dirt in the system, these things can get dirt on the seats. One of the symptoms of that is, if I get dirt on the, on the bottom seat, that's the heating seat. So basically that's stopping water going around the heating. It only becomes active once the diverter motor actions it and it closes off the hot water port there. So one of the symptoms I can get with that is if I get some dirt on, the customer's gonna be complaining that the radiators are getting warm. Now we're doing these videos in winter, so my customer's not gonna complain about my radiators getting warm in winter, that's what they want. What they will be complaining about is the hot water not being as hot as it could be. Now again, we might think, because we're the experts, well, it's not going to be as warm because the water coming into the house is colder, but it's a case of checking things out, making sure it's not that. In summer, dead simple. They won't be using the heating, they're running a hot tap, usually in the filling a bath or uh, having a shower because the water's on for longer, the radiators start to warm up. It's a sure sign that the diverter, the washer on there could have failed or it could have got some dirt on. This is the latest cartridge. It's an old brass cartridge. That's all this boiler's ever had. The earlier boilers, like your Eco Blues, your Duotex, they used to have a plastic cartridge or plastic and brass. They became a little bit brittle after a while and occasionally they'd leak up the spindle. So Bax has brought out this new cartridge. It's got a double O-ring seal on, so it's got longer lifespan. So that's just a simple diverter cartridge. It can move in and out. It doesn't share the water, it's either all for heating or all for hot water. Now, one of the features on this boiler, it has an automatic bypass and the plate heat exchange is used as a bypass. The idea of a bypass is the pump, when it's running, it's creating force. Now, we've already talked about that pump, so it modulates down. 
Now occasionally it might get to a point where it's modulated on its lowest but the system's become so small it still needs to release some of that energy. So we need a bypass, we need a way of it short circuiting. And what happens is under pressure that seat can be lifted up. The hot water seat gets lifted up under pressure and it allows some water to go through the plate heat exchanger. So that's how this particular boiler has an automatic bypass on it. So following on from that, we're going to have a look at the hot water um, sensor, the Hall effect sensor. So that's the next thing we're going to remove. Right, so we're going to remove the, uh, the floor switch. It's a Hall effect sensor, HAWL. All that means it works on the principle of a magnet. This particular version is a turbine, so it spins round. On some of the earlier Batsy boilers, the Duotex, they used a bobbin. Look very, very similar. Now for ease, I'm going to remove the low pressure cutoff switch just to make sure that I can get my box spanner in there without actually causing a problem. I could get it on there, but there's a chance that I'm going to damage the low pressure cutoff. So I'll just remove this. I'll just give you a quick word about what this does just before we take that Hall effect sensor out. So the idea of this little fella is to make sure that the boiler's got pressure in. If the pressure drops below half a bar, it'll flash up an error code and that means the system needs to be repressurized and it won't allow the boiler to operate. So that's the idea behind that. So we don't fire the boiler without any water because we don't want to dry fire it because it can damage the main heat exchanger. So that's just the low pressure cut off. I've just removed that and I'll put that to one side. So now I'm using a box spanner. It's an 18 millimeter and it's six sided. Um, I've, all, well, I've had installers turn on so they can't get a spanner that fits, it slips. It's because the edges are rounded and I'll show you in a bit more detail. Once we've got it out, we'll zoom in so you can see that. But a six sided 18 mil fits perfect and it doesn't slip. So I'm just gonna pop that on and I'm gonna start slapping it off. And then I can get in and just start to undo it. Once it starts freeing off, I can then pop it out. Get it hand tight. And then I can remove it. So now what I'm gonna do is take this in bits. It will pull in bits so you can clean them out. Because again, depending on what type of area that you, you're working in, where I live, Yorkshire, water's very, very soft. So we don't tend to get a lot of calcification. Some areas in the past I've worked up in Hartlepool, really, really hard water up there. So the first thing on there is a little filter. It's just to stop any large particles actually getting inside there. So I'm just gonna remove that. I just popped it off. Now inside the end of there, there's a flow restrictor. Now depending on the output of this or the, the literage on the particular boiler, that will be set and there's different colours. This one's a brown one, and then stamped on the top it says 12 litres. This is 12 litres a minute. So again, this is unscrewed. I've slackened this one off, I will be honest with you, just before we uh, took it out. It has been slackened off a little bit, but you'd normally pop a spanner on there. You don't want to put grips on because the brass is so fine around where that is, you can crush it and damage it. So that's popped out. Underneath there, we've now got a fine filter, a fine gauze filter, so even smaller particles to stop them getting into the turbine. So again, I'm just gonna tap that, and that's popped out. So inside there now, I've got the little turbine, so I'm just gonna tap it onto my hand. So that's the pivot point, that's what the turbine sits onto. So it sits on there, and if I pop that, and that's just a brass housing with an O-ring on it. So we'll pop that to one side. So that's your turbine, that sits onto your pivot point and it allows it to spin. So on the top of it, there's a magnet. Now that's not a solid round magnet. If you imagine a chocolate cake, and there's me and Alan here, and we quite like his cake because we're two big lads. So we're gonna cut it into four pieces because we're a bit greedy. We're gonna have two pieces each. Well, my two pieces have got magnets in because I need a bit of iron. Alan's haven't got magnets, so that bit's mine that bit's mine, and those two are Alan's. So as it's spinning, it picks up magnet, no magnet, magnet, no magnet. That's how it knows it's spinning. Again, in future, we're gonna do a video more in depth, so you'll see the little light come on. On these, they have a little red top because that signifies it's a turbine. The one on the Duotex, which is a bobbin, or the Platinums, or the Pro Maxes, all that range, they have a clear top. So that's your Hall effect sensor. 
That's how the circuit board knows the tap's turned on. It knows when Mrs. Miggins has turned her tap on that it, got, it needs a hot water demand. So that's the Hall Effect sensor. We can strip them out and clean them if it's a hard water area, just to make sure it's going. Because the complaint's gonna be, I've got intermittent hot water. Sometimes the boiler fires up, other times it doesn't. And then we may see the little light flickering as it's turning uh, the tap on and off. So the next thing we're gonna have a look at will remove the plate heat exchanger. So to remove the plate heat exchanger, we've got two cross head screws, one there and one underneath. So we're just gonna remove those. Obviously, we've got a lot of parts out of this boiler. In, in reality, to remove a plate heat exchanger, you wouldn't normally have to remove half these parts that we've done. So, start slapping that one. And then the plate heat exchanger can come out through there. In reality, all you'd normally do is just pop the diverter motor and it'd come out through that gap. Even with the gas valve in, in place, it would come out. So this is the plate heat exchanger. You can see it's got four holes in. The top two holes are for your primary water, the water that's going around your main heat exchanger. So that's actually coming into this part here and it's going across, up and down, up and down. Inside there, it's like a honeycomb and you've got close proximity of two different plates. You've got the plates that are running with your primary water, so they're going that way, and the plates that are running with your mains water, which are running this way. So the idea is the two hottest points are together and the two coolest points. The primary water is coming in this side and returning back through the pump, through the main heat exchanger, picking up heat and going there. The cold water is coming in, going through the plates, through there, and it's coming out hot through there. And it's going past the, the hot water thermistor, the hot water temperature sensor, which we'll come back to shortly. So this particular plate heat exchange, it's a 12 plate. You will find these in different thicknesses, dependent on output of boilers. You're not gonna get any faster flow rate the bigger the plate, you're just gonna get hotter transfer. So the higher the output boiler, probably the thicker the plate, the quicker the water gets hotter. The output is on the amount of heat that you put in there. So typically a 24 kilowatt boiler is gonna give you somewhere in the region nine to 10 liters a minute. A 30 liter is gonna be 12, 13 liters a minute. And then you're looking at 36 kilowatts, you're talking about 14, 15 liters a minute. And some of the larger outputs, your 40 kilowatts, you're talking 16, maybe 17 liters a minute. So that's all based on the heat that's going into your boiler. On this one, there's a little diagram that's showing which way the diverter valve goes so that you can't put it in the wrong way around. As you can see on this particular one, that stud is in between those two connections. That one's slightly offset. So you can't really put this in the wrong way around. So that's your plate heat exchanger. So next thing we're going to move on to is the hot water sensor. So we're going to remove the uh, hot water temperature sensor or the mister as they're commonly known. Um, there are what's called an NTC sensor. What that means is the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down and you measure them on resistance. Quite a common sensor. This has been used by quite a lot of other manufacturers. Bax has been using a very similar, if not the same sensor for a good number of years. On the earlier boilers, going back to 105's early Duotex, they used to have a fibre washer and that could leak. They've now changed over a few years ago to a copper washer. So the copper washer is now available as a spare, 72111908. That's your part number if you need one of them. It's one of the few part numbers I can remember. So that's the uh, temperature sensor. Again, in future videos, we're gonna go through testing these sensors, but basically that's sending a resistance reading down to the circuit board. The circuit board transfers that into a temperature so it knows when the water's getting warm enough, it can start to reduce that uh, temperature or reduce the amount of gas to maintain the temperature. So the next thing we're gonna move on to are the flow and return thermistors. Now these two are clip-ons. They're both exactly the same. They work on the same principle as the hot water thermistor. It's just a different style. What uh, a lot of manufacturers have realized is if you put a pocket into a pipe, so wet pocket sensors, you're restricting the flow. So the pump's got to work harder. We've talked about energy efficient pumps. So if you put a pocket in, your pump's are using more energy to overcome the restriction at pocket. So a lot of manufacturers have moved over onto clip-on thermistors. So this boiler's got two. 
There's one on the floor which I've just removed and the one on the return I've just took off. They're exactly the same sensor. They work on the same principle as the hot water one, they're NTC sensors. And they work on the round, round about the same band. There are different bands. These are 10,000 ohms at 25 degrees. So if I measured them with a, with a multimeter and the temperature was 25 degrees, I'd get a resistance reading of approximately 10,000 ohms. Again, as I say, we're gonna do a video later on in this series showing how to test these things. So those two are your flow and return sensors. The reason you've got a flow and a return on, the boiler's monitoring the flow and return temperatures. So obviously as the return temperature's creeping up, the boiler can modulate down because it's all about energy efficiency. So the last thing we're going to look at is the PRV. Your PRV is there to relieve pressure. It's a pressure relief valve. As we've talked about right at the beginning when we talked about the expansion vessel, that's taking up the expansion of water. If that caused a problem, that expansion can't be taken up. We don't want the boiler to pop any seals. We want it to relieve that pressure. This particular one's got a hex head on it. So we can actually put a spanner on there and we could, if we needed to, slacken that off and remove the insides. Now, the actual manufacturers of the valve, Khalifa, it's an Italian brassware company, say they don't want people doing that because it's a safety device. Well, yes, yeah, it's a safety device, but we're not actually touching the safety device. And I've just cleaned it off a little bit there. All we're doing is checking this washer. It's what's termed a top hat washer because it looks like a little top hat. And what can happen is you can get a bit of dirt. As you might be able to see on this one, there's a little bit of dirt on there. Now that could be sitting on that seat and it can cause it to drip. So we can take that out, give it a bit of a clean up, just make sure it's nice and clean. And we've not, we've not affected, we've not done anything with the cartridge. So we can pop that back on and there's a little retaining clip or a little retaining washer and that can screw back in and then we do it hand tight and then just to make sure it's nipped up we can use the trusty adjustable spanner and just nip it up so that's basically the vast majority of parts on that boiler i haven't covered the condensate trap but that's there to take your condensate and to make sure that any condensate coming from the boiler it forms a water seal it's all because we don't want it anything tracking back up any foul smells and things like that coming from where it's connected into so that's your condensate trap so that covers today's video thanks very much for watching my name's Roy Fugler thanks to Alan for doing the video catch us again at Viva Training Academy in here in Halifax look forward to seeing you next time bye Thank you very much for that, Roy, and thank you once again to Viva Training Academy for helping and supporting with this channel and um, helping you guys as well. I really appreciate it. And if you've got any questions, please ask them in the comments below. We are going to do some more videos, so me and Roy are going to spend some time, we're going to do some more videos for you. So again, if you've got any suggestions on what videos would help you, if you could put them in comments below. Um, that'd be good as well. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thanks for watching.